So I think my my advice is think like a bank. Think like a large corporation or a bank where you're always earning compound interest regardless of market situations and you always have access to that money. Welcome to the Bulletproof Cashflow Podcast. Let's get into the show. Hey everyone, this is Agostino. For those entrepreneurs not familiar with the infinite banking concept, it allows for real estate investments and tax benefits and asset protection as well. So the key though is understanding how to apply these concepts effectively and to your specific situation. Well, today's guest understands how to apply this structure and much, much more. He found that real estate investors, business owners, and retirees grow and protect their wealth predictably and safely by using the banking on yourself concept. Now, by applying the bank on yourself strategy, people can use its key long-term financial benefits. Today, as the founder of Financial Asset Protection, he and his team help high net worth individuals, entrepreneurs, and real estate investors with wealth preservation and growth. With all that, I'd like to welcome Sari Ibrahim to the show. Hey, Sari, thanks for coming on, man. Hey, Agostino. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's going to be great. Now, if you like what Sari has to say, you can reach him via his website at finassetprotection.com. And if you like our content, please don't forget to leave a comment and rate the show. It helps us out tremendously when you do. Finally, if you text the word freedom to 202-410-4202, you'll get our free ebook, The Bulletproof Guide to Finding a Broker. Okay, Siri, go ahead and tell the listeners a little bit more about what infinite banking actually is. Yeah, definitely. So infinite banking, also known as the bank on yourself concept, they're both the same, just different trademarks. They both use whole life insurance, mainly for the cash, cash use, the living benefits of the policy. And with the cash use of the policy, there comes a lot of additional benefits, benefits that you typically can't find in like a checking savings, money market, brokerage account, the cash value of the policy. And for those of you who don't know, whole life insurance has two main functions. It has the cash value part, and then it has the death benefit. The infinite banking concept is mostly concerned with the cash value part. And the cash value part grows at a guaranteed uh, and safe, predictable rate regardless of market conditions. Also, the growth of the cash value grows tax deferred. And you always have access to this money regardless of economic or market conditions and also regardless of your conditions. If you have credit issues or something's going on financially, you always have access to this money. So that's another reason why a lot of real estate investors use the infinite banking concept or the bank on yourself concept when investing in real estate. Awesome. So let's let's break it down even simpler than that like let's actually talk about let's say joe has a whole life policy and uh it's thirty thousand dollars okay let's say like maybe he might have got this when he was uh maybe in his 20s or something like that now he's in his 30s and i'm assuming you're you're paying into this policy right you you, you got a policy and you're paying into it correct correct and uh, so now you're in your 30s how how can how can a guy like joe is listening right now use this 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 policy like how 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 would he be able to access this policy and what would he be able to do with it mm -hmm. yeah so let's just say joe's been funding this policy for some years now he's built up some cash value and let's say for example he's gotten the cash value to the point of like a hundred thousand dollars in cash value that he could use so let's say joe comes across a real estate deal it requires him to invest like fifty thousand dollars of his own money now, Joe has some options. He can go to a bank, he can go to a private money lender, but instead he chooses to go to him, his self, his own policy for that loan. So he borrows $50,000 from the insurance company uh, and leveraging his cash value. But the difference is, is that instead of him deducting $50,000 from $100,000 cash value, instead he borrows against it. So what he, the way what happens now is his $100,000 cash value continues to compound and earn interest and dividends as if he never touched it because he's borrowing from the insurance company's general funds. Now this allows him to become his own source of financing. Also, he can structure that loan on his own terms. So he could say, you know what, I want to stretch this out into five years and just make monthly payments for five years on this loan. And then after doing so, he would pay a simple interest rate of 5% to the insurance company, but his $100,000 cash value would earn compound interest and dividends throughout the, throughout the years. So let's say after, for example, just kind of like a rough estimate, after five years, he would have paid back about $53,000 total to the insurance company, about $3,000 in interest. But his policy would have grown by about 4 or 5% compound interest. So he might have like $165,000 in cash value, 
but he paid in $52,000. So okay. now there's an arbitrage of about 13000 So he made money in his policy and he made money with the real estate investment at the same time. Nice, nice. So basically then the the $100,000 policy, the hundred grand is still growing, even though he borrowed the 50000 and it's still growing at the interest rate thing you said your in your example was was six uh, percent or something like that, right? Yeah. And 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 that fifty thousand, you're still paying. He's got to pay interest on it. Then is what it sounds like, right? Correct. So, but it's that that delta that delta is what you're talking about, right? Because that that uh, I think he's he he's paying five percent to the insurance company, but it's growing at but the the hundred thousand is growing at a much higher rate. Yeah, and a different way too. The the hundred thousand is growing with compound interest, but he's right. only buying the money at simple interest. Nice. Wow, that's uh, that's amazing stuff. So, but the, the, I think the key though is is that he's got to have that money in that in that whole life policy. So it takes a little bit of forethought, right? Yeah, it that. takes discipline. Yeah, exactly. It takes discipline, and there's a saving accumulation, a capitalization period that you have to capitalize the policy. Right, right, right. But he can use that money for whatever he wants. He can use it for a flip. He can use it for a vacation. He can do whatever with, with it, right? It's like, there's no real limit, is there? Exactly. There's no limit, and there's no like government restrictions, like IRS restrictions. You're not. You don't have to like transfer the money to a separate LLC and hire a property manager. You can directly use those funds out of the whole life policy for whatever you want, whether it's real estate or other businesses you have, you could use it for, you could you'd even use it for your own vacation or for your own home needs if you want. It right. doesn't really matter. Right, right, right. Huh. What if, what if Joe says, you know what, I'm not paying this thing back. Screw it. I'm not doing it. So what happens then? Yeah. So what happens then is um, the loan balance would just keep growing because he's not paying it back. And then once the loan balance exceeds the cash value, then the policy would lapse. And we always tell clients, you want to treat it like your own bank. You would never want to steal it from yourself. Like if you borrow from yourself, you want to pay yourself back. Same thing in this situation. You want to treat it like your own like business. Right, right, right. So this is, this is a case where you, you, don't, you want to pay it back. I mean, you want to take advantage of that policy because obviously the, the plus side is better than not paying it back. <laughs> exactly. Plus you have the death benefit too. Even though the infinite banking concept is more concerned about the cash value, it's still important to consider the death benefit, you know? That death benefit will lead to tax-free generation, multi-generational wealth for your family. So that's really important to keep that living, keep that death benefit still there, keep it active. So that way you can pass something on to your family, hopefully really late in life. Interesting. So let's say, for instance, in this case, uh, the same example. So Joe borrows at fifty thousand uh, dollars, but then something happens to him a month later. You know, something tragic happens, and mm-hmm. he's no longer with us. So the insurance company is going to make, they're going to pay out on that hundred thousand dollars, pay out his family or whoever's in the will or whatever. So if his cash value is a hundred thousand dollars, his death benefit is probably 10 to 15 times that. So his death benefit is probably going to be about 1 million, 1.5 million. Right. And if he does pass away after taking out the loan, they would just deduct 50,000 from 1 million minus wow. interest. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So now how come people don't do this? I mean, it sounds like this is like almost too good to be true, right? So any idea why people are not using this concept? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's because of the media and because of a lot of like experts out there. Like, for example, like Dave Ramsey, Susie Orman, they do say a lot of good things about financial services. But when it comes to whole life insurance, they say some things that could be true. Like, for example, they say that whole life insurance um, is a terrible investment because it grows really slowly. And what they're referring to is traditional whole life insurance. Now, think about it this way. Let's say that you were building a house. And let's say that you thought, I'm, I'm going to build this house and make it into, uh, t- I'm going to allocate 2,000 square feet. I want the house to be 2,000 square feet. But let's say you put that all entirely into the foundation. So just it's just a basement that's 2,000 square feet. It would be really inefficient, right? It wouldn't really do, it would be huge, but it would be, it would also cost you a lot of money and it wouldn't be efficient. So a lot of old fashioned whole life policies are mostly based. They're entirely 100% just whole life insurance. But whereas the banking the infinite banking concept or the bank on yourself concept would emphasize more on the additional structure. So instead of doing like 2000 square feet in the basement, you would break it down into like a thousand square feet and then a thousand square feet above. So this way now it's a more efficient home. Same thing with the whole life policy. You would do like a 50, 50 split. So 50% of the premium would go towards the base of the policy. And the other 50% would go towards the cash value rider of the policy, the paid up additions rider. And this is what turbo charges the cash value this is what makes 
the whole real estate investing part fun and exciting because you could actually use the policy for your own source of financing and your own source of savings too. So a lot of times when these uh, financial experts in the media are talking, they're just talking about old fashioned whole life insurance. I think that's one reason why a lot of people stay away from whole life insurance is because of their uh, perception of it. Right, right, right. So I think it's something you just pointed out here a second ago is that not all whole life policies are created equal then. I mean, they're yeah. all different, right? And uh, But and to your point too, yeah, the media, they're going to spin whatever they're going to spin. Um, it's kind of like they're, they're going to try to sell you on something that someone else is making a fee off of it, where in, in the whole life policy, you're making the fee. <laughs> Basically, you know, you, you the individual, it, it, as long as you're using the money responsibly, uh, and not taking all these vacations and whatnot, but actually using it for, like, say, building your business, you could uh, you can actually use it responsibly. So, uh, and of course, make money at the same time. But uh, so, so, what sort of policies are, are these, and that people ought to be looking for? Like, what what are, what are the special things? Like, you touched on it a second ago, but is, is there anything else I ought to be looking for specifically? Yeah, you want to make sure it's from a mutual insurance company, not a stock-owned company. The reason why is mutual insurance companies give their profits or their dividends back to the policy owners, whereas stock-owned companies give their dividends back to the shareholders. So it has to be a mutually owned insurance company. Uh, the second thing is, is you want to make sure the company has a non-direct recognition loan feature as opposed to direct recognition. And what that means is, do you remember the example we talked about, the $100,000 example and yeah. how it compounds and grows? If it's a direct recognition, the insurance company would reduce the dividends and interest based on the existing loan. So they would kind of like penalize you for taking out the loan, whereas a non-direct recognition would not recognize that outstanding loan. So you want to make sure it is a non-direct recognition loan. And the third piece is the structuring of the policy. So a policy can either be all base, 100% base, or it could be like 50-50, like 50% base, or some situations are even more like 60% base. Uh, but the, you need the paid up additions rider. The paid up additions rider is the cash value rider of the policy. And that's what turbo charges the cash value. So it has to be mutually owned, uh, non-direct recognition, and you need the paid up additions rider. Right, right, right. So basically then conceivably for anybody listening right now, they could basically give you a shout. You can line them up with, with the right policy. But let's say, for instance, they, they get a windfall and they sell that maybe they flip a couple of houses and now they're sitting on hundred K they can go ahead and create a whole life policy and still have access to that cash to keep growing their business and, and also get this whole life policy. I guess the downside though, the quote downside, I guess, is that they, there's additional paperwork involved, of course. Right. It's, but there's also this, this interest you're going to have to pay on it. But at the same time too, you're also compounding that interest on on the full 100k amount as well. So there's is that does that sound accurate? Yeah, exactly. Yes. Okay. So sorry, I heard of this this concept where people are basically using the same the same the same whole life policy to basically buy cars through their company and basically creating a loan against their company so they can write off the the the, the interest or something. Is that is that sound accurate to you? Like, is there a way to do that kind of le legally? And, and still get still enjoy the tax or the, the yeah, I guess the the tax write off on that interest is that even possible to do in a case like this? Yeah. So just to be clear for the listeners, I'm not a tax expert, so consult with your tax expert for doing this. But yeah, you can definitely do that. Um, it would just be a separation of like uh, entities if it's owned by the company or or however you have structured. But yeah, that is possible where you can write off uh, the interest. You can essentially the same way how you would finance from a bank. You could do that with yourself. And a lot of our clients essentially um, shift from becoming like real estate investors or like other business owners to actually like the banking world where they're loaning money to other people and they're experiencing the interest gains as well as the tax benefits of doing that. So I definitely think it's possible. And we actually have the resources to connect clients with those, with those methods so that way they could, if they wanted to become private money lenders or loan money to other people using their whole life policy, we could definitely set that up. Right, right, right. Now, let's talk a little bit about the, the tax implications. You know, at the opening, uh, and even in the green room, we touched on it in terms of saving money on taxes. How how do you shelter that money from taxes? Is this some other way that you guys are doing it, or is it the same sort of uh, bank on yourself policy here? Yeah. So one way is for your income that you make, you could what you could do is you could 
pay taxes on it, deposit it into the account. Now, when you do that, it grows tax deferred. So even if there are gains every year in the policy, you never have to report those gains. Also, when you take the money out in a lot of situations, actually in most situations, when you use after tax dollars, the money is now tax free. And what happens is, is now you can recycle this tax free money while still earning the compound interest at a tax deferred. And what happens is, is that you shift from, let's say you're in the 25% tax bracket to the 0% tax bracket. Now, so with your money being in the whole life policy, you grow in tax deferred, even if there's a spike in taxes in the future. And I think there will be based on, you know, with all the stimulus and PPP funds going out and all the government funding right now, trillions of dollars. I think the government is going to need a way to recoup that money and they're going to do that by increasing tax rates. But if your money is locked into, actually not locked into, but saved into a whole life policy, you hedge against those potential tax rate increases. So I think that's pretty much the biggest, there's a lot of tax advantages, but that's pretty much the biggest tax advantage of the right. whole life process. And that's, that's huge. That's huge right there. Cause then I, 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 I believe you 100%, man. I mean, uh, we printed off $2 trillion uh, over the stimulus uh, earlier in, in 2020 and uh, they're, they're talking about yet another one. That money's got to come from somewhere. And yep. what people don't realize is that it, it comes from us paying taxes. <laughs> that's where yeah. it from. People seem to forget that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're right. Right. So, okay, good. So, uh, let's now, something you, you mentioned a, a bit ago, too um, the creating loans. Okay. So, that's a very powerful thing, right? So, mm -hmm. let's say, for instance, if, there's, if, if someone's a lender out there, uh, a hard money lender, uh, there's there's people out there that are, they're always looking for access to cash. You can actually use this whole life policy then and lend out your money at say twelve percent, and uh, you're sure you're, you're paying five percent to the insurance company, but you're keeping that delta right now. Are you taking that money then and putting it all back into the policy? Are you are you t are you keeping that money that that delta out to yourself because then you have to pay tax on that then right. Yeah, you'd have to pay tax on that delta outside of the policy, not inside the policy, but outside of it. So essentially what you, what you would be doing in that situation is you'd be making money outside the policy and inside the policy. The money outside, and if the policy is structured right, and again, it depends on the client, it depends on the company and the product with the company. Uh, but let's say there, there, there could be a situation where the client, the profits that he or she gets from private money lending after paying taxes on it, can roll it back into the policy to earn even more compound interest. So it'd be like saying you have a money making machine, you put a dollar in, you get a dollar fifty back, for example, and then you take that dollar fifty, you put it back in, and now you earn compound interest on that dollar fifty, not the original dollar. Same thing with the whole life process. There's a way where you can earn profits outside the policy, roll them back in to the policy, earn compound interest on that and keep it growing like a money making machine. And it, again, the policy has to be structured because it's IRS limits on how much you can overfund the policy. If you overfund it to a certain limit past the, uh, the insurance company sets that limit. If you overfund it past that limit, then uh, it could be a taxable vehicle. And in some situations, that's not always a bad thing. In some situations, it's called a modified endowment contract, contract or a MEC. A MEC isn't always a bad thing. It just means you have to pay taxes on the money you use. But some real estate investors might think the fact that it grows tax deferred and the fact that I'm still going to earn compound interest on the money regardless of market conditions, that might be a good fit regardless of the tax implications. Yeah. So, so how is this different than, let's say, a self-directed IRA then? I mean, because with a self-directed IRA, you can still do the loan thing. I think the, the, the one thing that a self-directed IRA does not do, is, which is a key difference, is that the compounded growth, right? Is that is that pretty much one of the the, the biggest difference or the only difference between uh, doing a whole life or bank on yourself versus uh, versus a self directed IRA? The uh, also the restrictions on what you could use the money for. Mm, That's yes. also yeah. That part that part is huge too, right? Because you can't exactly take that money out of your self directed IRA and go on a go on a trip or whatever, or even or even redo your own house, right? You yeah. can't do that. You can't renovate your own place with, with stuff like that. But with, uh, with, with doing this loan policy, basically the bank on yourself set, set up, that's, uh, that, that, that part is huge. So, so Sari, what, what sort of setup is required then for, for someone? Like how, what, what, are the, some of the, like, what are some of the ways to get something like this done? It sounded like it varies from individual to individual, right? Yeah. So I, I would say if you're listening to this and you're thinking about this, 
The first step is research the infinite banking concept or the bank on yourself concept. There's a lot of free content out there, podcasts, YouTube videos, research it. And then we would get on a call, a 15 minute intro call. And this is just to see if this is the right fit. I have some prospects that call and they're just looking for loans only. So this won't really help you if you're just looking for loans. It, it, this is more of like a process, a mind shift. So I want to make sure they're on the same page. And the second step would be the confidential analysis. The confidential analysis is, takes about 60 to 90 minutes to do. And this is where we dig into your assets, your cash flow, what you're currently doing, what you want to accomplish. We take pretty much all of that and we use that to analyze the situation because there's different companies and each company has different products and there's different amounts. So it's kind of really hard to judge what's good for the client without knowing anything about the client yet. So the confidential analysis is where we know the client, we get to know the client. And the third call that we have, that's when we present the solution based on what we uncovered in the second call. We show the client how, it, you know, for example, if a client mentions how they don't like the stock market risk, they've lost money, they don't want that feeling again. We mentioned, Mr. Client, you mentioned you don't like the market risk. With this policy, there is no market risk. You can always expect in the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, you'll have this much in cash value. You'll always have access to this money. You can always use it. And then the fourth step is execution, where we uh, submit the application. It goes through medical underwriting. Uh, it takes about four to six weeks after that point. And then they can start making their first payment. So it's typically from the intro call, day one, to the client actually saving in the policy. It's about a six month on average, a six month gap. Right. So I think uh, um, it's definitely something you also want to research on your own. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of content out there on how to learn more about the infinite banking concept or the bank on yourself concept. Right, right, right. So now let's say for instance, okay, great. So uh, I, I don't have to make payments. I can just drop 100K in there, no problem, right? It doesn't really matter. You guys don't care. Yeah, there there are some situations. Like for example, I had a client, he sold one of his property properties. He got uh, $400,000 in cash. He because he bought the property, he had no loan on it, and then he rolled four hundred thousand dollars into a bank on yourself policy, just a one time payment, single premium payment. And then his cash value in year one was about three hundred seventy five thousand, and his death benefit was five hundred eighty thousand dollars day one. And then what happens now is uh, both the cash value and the death benefit grow, um, guaranteed about four to five percent every single year, regardless of market conditions the growth of the, the cash value grows tax deferred. And if something happens to him, his family would get a tax-free death benefit. And now let's say he's still in the process now, but let's say he finds another property that he wants to buy. Again, instead of going to a bank, instead of going to somebody else, he can go to himself and borrow up to, in the first year, up to $375,000 in cash value. So that, and then the cool thing about that is there's no, there's no more commitments to monthly payments. He could just, he made that one payment. He always has access to that money. And he doesn't have to commit to any more payments after that. Nice, nice. And as far as limits, you, you mentioned something about a limit, but is there a limit then on, on, on the whole life policy? Uh, for the single premium part? Yeah. yeah. You, usually it's 25, usually death benefit, usually it's 25 times your annual income. So if you okay. make uh, 100,000, it's like 2.5 million, right? 25 times that, 2.5 million death benefit. So, uh, and the death benefit, uh, the cash value is based on a portion of the death benefit. So that, that's only the only, that's those are the only limits when you start the policy. But as far as overfunding the policy, uh, they have a separate equation where they do like a seven pay premium equation where they calculate the first seven years, and the insurance company will say every year you could do a maximum of this much extra towards the cash value. Anything above this, it becomes a modified endowment contract or a MEC, and then now you have to pay taxes on withdrawals and loans from the policy. Exactly. Exactly. So so it sounds like then. For someone who's really planning out their their entire, I guess their, their entire financial life, this is just one of the life insurance, so to speak, setups you want to have in your business. Because there's other there's other policies you may want to have in place as well, right? I mean, you can get multiple policies. You don't have mm -hmm. to have just one, right? So, uh, because it sounds to me like the whole life it has has a great way of of doing the banking yourself uh, setup, but there are other policies that that have greater, m more money to come out of it if something happens to you to, for, for your loved ones and uh, with, with very different premium levels is what it sounds like, right? 
Yeah, definitely. It's a good point. Yeah. So based on the confidential analysis, that call, uh, we discover what the client is most concerned about. If a client wants to utilize the cash value for real estate purposes, for example, and also wants a huge death benefit, what would we do is we would do the whole life policy the same way. And then we would add like a term policy because the term premiums are so much cheaper, probably less than 20% of the whole life cost. But of course, the whole life has a cash value part, everything else mentioned in this episode. But the term is way cheaper, so we could do both. We could do the term policy with the whole life policy. That way, if something happens to the client, you know they can get a much higher death benefit in the process of building up their empire. So it all comes down to the analysis and what the client is concerned about. Nice. Excellent. Excellent. And, and typically, how long does it take to get your hands on that money? So that in your example, this, this, this guy wanted to have access to his 375. How long does it take for him to get access to that money when he needs it? About five to seven business days after the policy is accepted. Cool. Nice. So, and they just wire it back to you or like, how does that work? There's a form you print. It's so weird how they still do like everything like on paper, but you have to print out a form, fill it out. They ask you where you want that money to go. You sign it, mail it to the insurance or fax it to the insurance company. And then five to seven days later, it'll be in that account. Fax, huh? That's, that's <laughs> right there, man. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> 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 that's funny all right well good stuff and this uh, this sounds like a, a real great way to not only set money aside but also the, the whole bank on yourself concept is just phenomenal not many people know about it and it really is a great way to sock away cash and still borrow money from yourself basically it's, it's it sounds it sounds super it sounds mm-hmm. super great uh, so Sari, what is that one piece of bulletproof advice that you would give to someone listening right now? Yeah, I would say um, advice, think like, a, think like a bank. You know, with in, as far as whole life policies, banks actually use 80% of a bank's tier one capital is located in whole life insurance. And the reason why they do that is so they can earn interest in the whole life policy and earn interest out from the customers, from the borrowers. So they have money working two places. So I think my my advice is think like a bank. Think like a large corporation or a bank where you're always earning compound interest regardless of market situations and you always have access to that money. Excellent, excellent. All right, guys, if you want to reach out to Sari, you can reach him via his contact page at finassetprotection.com. I hope you got some insight on how you can build we can build your own bank, basically fire your banker, bypass Wall Street and take control of your financial future. Thanks for tuning in and I'll see you in the next episode. Take care. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed the Bulletproof Cashflow podcast. 